couldn't stay there for very long. I had to paddle out and go downstream. I knew if I stopped, I'd be an easy target. That night, I had a long argument with Gordon. I can't let him go off on his own like that because we're approaching the longest stretch of whitewater I've ever attempted in my life. Flipping a raft in huge white water can be fatal. People can drown in a hurry if they hit their head on a rock or get snagged underwater. On earlier expeditions, at least six people have died in this one section alone. morning, Michelle steered his raft right into my worst nightmare. I did a perfect flip. Everybody, the three of us went into the water. thinking, oh my god, there's a crocodile in the river. And this was the first time on the entire expedition where I could actually feel the hair go up on the back of my neck. We knew there could be crocodiles around it. Usually they wait in the rapids so they can catch the fish which broke through the rapids. And we were big fishes. <laughs> Everyone in Michelle's boat is lucky to be alive. We'll be able to come down and go through here, but I think it's safe. Yeah, I don't know. The run out isn't too bad. So. No, no. They are my way. at the border of Sudan. It's a dangerous place. Saskia, Miriam, and Muhammad are terrified about crossing into a country where civil war has been raging on and off for almost 20 years. They'll leave us here and rejoin us later in Khartoum. 
As soon as we crossed the border, Gordon and I took off exploring Sudan, the most mysterious country on the Nile. The Sudan is cloaked in secrecy behind the veil of Islam. When we came across a camel market, we were a little bit apprehensive at first, but we decided to go for it. How often do you get to bid at a camel auction? It turned out to be a great day. And I was sure glad when Gordon was outbid on that camel. Even mad dogs and Englishmen don't come out in this type of heat. 115 degrees in the shade was normal. Here in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, the two rivers converge. The White Nile comes in on the right, under the bridge, to join our much larger Blue Nile. It was great to have the team back together again. War and violence are widespread in the Sudan, and yet we never once ran across a single militant extremist. Here we were surrounded on all sides by happy, good-hearted Muslim people giving us the warmest of welcomes. And they were amazed at how far we traveled down the Nile. Pascuala, how did you say hello? hello? We're heading for the ancient city of Meroe, one of the Nile's best-kept secrets. In the remote desert of Sudan, the Nile flows right past an ancient ghost town a few outsiders have ever visited. We're among the lucky few. The Nubians ruled this region of the Nile for over a thousand years. Over 2,000 years ago, these pyramids of Moroi were surrounded by forests. When the Nubians cut all the trees down, they allowed the sands to blow in and hastened their own downfall. I feel the loss of a great civilization and the loss of the forest. The systems that support life are so fragile. If we don't nurture them, they turn to sand and dust. haunting echoes of an ancient dynasty half buried in sand and obscurity. Why, when the Egyptian pharaohs are so revered, do the Nubians still languish in the shadows of history? It's the greatest mystery we've encountered along the Nile. Sudan proved to be full of surprises. The 
friendliness of the people, and the haunting beauty of this lost kingdom, the kingdom of Kush. Near the border of Sudan and Egypt, the Nile River flows into Lake Nasser. A fishing boat captain warned us that we'd never get across Lake Nasser safely in our tiny rafts. To make up for lost time, I decided that Gordon and I should keep crossing Lake Nasser by night on our own. Big mistake. A huge windstorm came up out of nowhere. up to 60 miles an hour and the cold spray was freezing us to the bone. We were 10 miles from shore. If a big wave knocked us overboard, there'd be no way for anyone to find us and we'd die of exposure. Pasquale was in bad shape. I was afraid he wouldn't make it. We're all very tired. Um, we're very tired from the wind and the sun on our faces and the water. Um, so tonight would be hopefully be a good night. It's been a long, long haul at this point. This has come down to the grind. It really has come down to the grind. I was battling a relapse of malaria. I had chills, fever, and I was just totally exhausted. I was sore, I was sick. We hated to give up our dream of running the Nile, but it, it, it just wasn't worth dying for. But the next day, I was revived by a pharaoh's dream and a remarkable survival story. When the Nile Valley was flooded, Ancient monuments disappeared beneath Lake Nasser, but this one survived. In 1260 BC, the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses the Great had this temple built along the banks of the Nile. As an Egyptologist, Miriam lives and breathes this stuff. Forty years ago, the new man-made lake was about to flood this temple. To save it, workers carefully cut the huge temple apart and moved it block by block to higher ground. Moving this temple was a heroic effort. If they can pull that off, Gordon and I could finish what we set out to do. The ancient Egyptians studied the stars and used that knowledge to create the first accurate calendar with 365 days a year. The temple was perfectly lined up with the sun. On a prescribed day, the sunrise reaches deep into the temple to light up the royal statues. Exactly how they were able to achieve this was well, a mystery to me. My Egyptian ancestors once had two things to fear from the Nile. Too much water and too little. But no longer. The Aswan High Dam has put an end to the catastrophic floods that once killed thousands of people. But the dam is a mixed blessing because the summer floods no longer enrich the farmland. They no longer leach salts out of the soil. Without the summer floods, there is no more need for these nylometers. Uh, the markers the pharaohs used to track 
the yearly rise of the Nile. right in abandoned Christian monastery, just a few miles from the river, where Miriam found an unexpected link between religion and the Nile. Priests at monasteries like this always had strong links to the church at Lalabella in Ethiopia. When the Christians here were in danger of being wiped out by the Muslim majority, the Ethiopians upriver threatened to block off the Nile, and the threat worked. This is how Christianity survived here for so long. Miriam told us how the pharaohs felt blessed by nature and God. The Nile was the perfect trade route. The trade winds carried the sailboats upriver, and then the river's flow brought them back down again. This turned the Nile into a river of gold. After more than three months on the river, we had our routine down cold. We stop, unpack the boat, make dinner, we condense up, eat, take a shower, go to sleep, wake up, pack the boats. It's every day, day after day, day after day, day after day. I first saw Luxor as a boy, yet after visiting the source of the Nile, all this looks different to me. For 3,000 years, Egypt was ruled by pharaohs like Ramses the Great and the female pharaoh Hatshepsut. The Nile turned them into living gods. No wonder they worshipped the river. It was 115 degrees when Miriam took us to the Valley of the Queens, where we visited the tomb of Queen Nefertari, the favorite wife of Ramses the Great. At the tomb of the pharaoh Tutmosis III, I told my friends how the Nile was revered as a passageway into both life and death. And for me too, this has been more than a river trip. It was like a, an inner voyage. It did change me. Reaching Cairo was a milestone. After months of sand dunes and mud huts, the city dazzles me like some fabulous mirage. With the Nile as their power base, the pharaohs ruled for 3,000 years. Their dynasties are long gone, but the river's spiritual power remains. I think that I've gained something spiritually from this trip. Sharing this expedition with Pasquale has let's shown me that really anything is possible if your heart's in it. After four long, grueling months and 3,000 miles, we finally made it to the Mediterranean. I can't believe it. We're the first people in history to go all the way from source to sea on the Blue Nile. As we finally hit the surf and the salt water, I, I was flooded with exhaustion and pride and just overwhelming joy. The 
river that connects people. The lucky necklace from a Christian girl in Ethiopia brought me new friends all along the Nile. The times that meant the most to me are the simple everyday encounters with people along the river. You know, Gordon and I had some real rough spots along the way, but he came through when the chips were down I needed and he saved my life more than once. We've all got infinite respect now for this river. You know, we realized that when we finally stepped on the beaches of Alexandria, our final destination. I was so proud of taking part in this expedition. I went right away to visit my grandfather. As a farmer, he treasured the vial of holy water I brought him from the source. A Muslim girl in Alexandria admired my necklace. I have this for what luck. People of many cultures share the river. A lot of them in conflict, but um, most of them in harmony. Our friends in Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt follow different religions. Yet they all draw spiritual sustenance from the river. The Nile has brought such wealth and power that many have tried to own it. But the river has defied even the mightiest pharaohs because it's greater than all of us. The waters of the Nile bring life and nourish the soul. Yeah, by way.